Welcome to the Nurse Shark Academy Show, a Baxter Professional Services production. Welcome to the Nurse Shark Academy Show, where we're experts in nursing and experts in business. My name is Tina Baxter and I'm your host. Today's episode is how one CNA was inspired to become an RN and a legal nurse consultant. And our guest today is Sylvia Enigne. Nurses, are you ready for more? My mission is for you to own your seat at the table of nurse entrepreneurship, gaining confidence, skills, and the freedom to live your life on your own terms. Assisting you in achieving your goals through tailored advice, continuous learning, and a collaborative approach is at the heart of everything I do. Stop being eaten alive. Come feel the sun. Be a nurse shark. And welcome to the Nurse Shark Academy Show. I'm Tina Baxter, your host. The Nurse Shark Academy Show highlights nurse business owners and others in the healthcare field who promote entrepreneurship. We interview nurse leaders and encourage them to tell their story. My mission is for you to own your seat at the table of nurse entrepreneurship, gaining the confidence, skill, and freedom to live your life on your own terms. You will dream big and expand your consciousness as an entrepreneur. Join us and support these wonderful nurse entrepreneurs and leaders. Today's guest is Sylvia and Yinye, and Yinye, um, and she is from California, and she, her business is Weber Legal Nurse Consulting. Um, Sylvia has served the state of California in the area of legal nurse consulting for the past 14 years with a strong emphasis on defense medical examinations. Welcome to the show, Sylvia. Hi, thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate it. I am so looking forward to this. I've been looking forward to this ever since I met you um, at Lori Brown's retreat. Um, it was great to meet you, though. Thank you. Yeah, I've been doing defense medical exams for 14 years. And as you know, I've written a book, Defense Medical Exams Made Easy, a Painless Guide for LNCs. And I also wanted to announce at your a podcast also that there is a book as well in the works for lawyers as well. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Yes. So we're definitely going to have to talk about that yeah, um, in a moment. But for let's, let's, and yeah, for lawyers. It, uh, it has about, we're, you know, trying to get it out within the next 90 days. Okay. All right. So we'll come back to that. Okay. Because we always like to start with the very uh, this very first question is, what made you become a nurse? How did you get into nursing? Oh, that's an easy question. How I got into nursing was through my grandfather on my mother's side. When I was 19 years old, my mom sent me from Nigeria back to Germany because I'm half Nigerian, half German. My mom sent me back to Germany to go to university in Germany. And at the time, her parents were getting older. And in context, my grandfather was actually diagnosed at the time with Alzheimer's. So I was sent there to help, you know, navigate through the, you know, challenges of having someone, a family member that has Alzheimer's because my grandmother was also way, you know, was close in age to my grandfather. She was only two years younger. So she was not in a state, you know, to handle the challenges that had to come with that. So what happened was what I, what mostly I can remember is one particular instance when my grandfather came into my room and asked me who I was just out of the blue. You know, he, he mm -hmm. came into my room, saw me studying and was asking me um, how, you know, who I was. And at the time I had no indication about Alzheimer's, knew nothing, you know, 19 years old, and I'm looking at him and saying, Granddad, what are you talking about? It's Sylvia, it's your granddaughter. He goes, who is Sylvia? And I was extremely puzzled, you know, and he took it a step further at the time, the window where I was in the room that I was, was open. 
my grandfather said, I don't know who you are. And my suitcase was, you know, kind of by the table. And he took the suitcase and threw it out the window and said to me, get out of my house. I don't know who you are. And I didn't know how to handle, you know, what was going on. But I went outside, got my suitcase back up. And by the time I got back up, I rang the doorbell, you know, to come back in because I didn't have a key. And he opened the door and he said, what are you doing, Sylvia, what are you doing outside with your suitcase? And I'm looking, you know, looking at him puzzled. Mm -hmm. You just throw, threw my suitcase out the window. What are you talking about? You know, your brain is going. So after this incident happened, I called my mother and told her everything that happened. And that was when she kind of explained to me little situations, you know, that he had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And she gave me a little pointers on how to deal with the situation. And that was kind of like my first, you know, indication in, or first your baptism into taking care of someone. And once I started taking care of him, I enjoyed it so much. I decided once I came to the state that I want uh, to go into nursing. He was my, uh, he was the reason why I decided to go into nursing. Well, that's wonderful. First of all, uh, very courageous for you at 19 to be taking care of your grandfather like that. Um, that's amazing because not a lot of people would be able to do that. And in particular, that situation where he's having memory loss and um, not sure who you are on time. So I commend you for that. And so what what was your um, what was your first day in nursing school like? Do you remember? Yes. My first day in nursing school was a nightmare. <laughs> the reason why I say it was a nightmare because by the time I got into nursing school, I had a background of being a CNA. And I had at that time, I think, been a CNA for 10 or 11 years. And technically, I thought I already knew because I was working in conjunction with nurses. I was... Um, you know, thinking, oh, yeah, you know, I know what the nurses do already because I work with them in the nursing home and at the hospital. So I know exactly what's going to happen. And then when I got into fundamentals of nursing, it was nothing like what I expected. So once we got into that, I kind of panicked. And I had um, a teacher at the time. Her, na her name was Margaret Avila. She was the one that taught us fundamentals of nursing. And I had a conference with her and she was the one that made me aware that anything I had learned at the hospital or at the nursing homes to put all that aside and simply do what, because what I was doing is I was getting assignments, you know, to do mm -hmm. in fundamentals of nursing. But what I was doing at the hospital was different than what was in the book, in the assignments. And that confused me and gave me a lot of anxiety. But this particular teacher helped me so well that she said, look, just forget about what you learned at the hospital. Forget about what you learned as a CNA. Just follow what we're telling you now in terms of nursing as an RN. Otherwise, you're going to have difficulties getting through this program. And after that, I was able to go. But of course, you know, it was an experience that was, I never want to repeat that experience. <laughs> you know, especially the math taken, you know, the math testing. <laughs> There were a lot of young kids, you know, 19, 20 years old that were in school with me. And these people, because they had gotten out of school, you know, just recently, right. they knew all these math things. I had to get coaching mm -hmm. to actually get through the math pro, you know, through the testing that you have to do every eight weeks. 
So by the time we got to the last uh, test, I, you know, heaved a sigh of relief. I said, oh, thank God, you know, that <laughs> that's over. And then after that, I thought that that was bad enough. Next thing I knew, then everybody started telling me about, you know, the boards. Yeah. You know, to take the boards. And uh, once we, I graduated from Mount St. Mary's University in Los Angeles in May 2011. At that time, all the new students, everybody was rushing, you know, to go and take the boards. And this is Sylvia, come on, let's go and take the boards. Let's go and take the boards. And I said, no, no, I'm not ready because when I was doing the nursing program, the reason why I chose that university, I could go to school at night. I could work seven to three as a CNA at LAC USC Medical Center. And then when I finished, I went straight to school for two years like that, you I know, see. and did my uh, clinicals on the weekend. So basically I had no day off. And even when I went to work, after work, I always had to go, you know, to school. So I was afraid that I would fail, you know, the board. So while everybody else was rushing, I waited. And I studied, did Kaplan, studied the testing, because I got um, feedback from people that the board is not necessarily a test of your knowledge, but is if you actually know how to take the test. If you don't know how to take the test, that's where your problem begins. So that's what I concentrated on. And when I finally took the boards, I had my son pick the date because I wasn't sure that, you know, if I picked the date, it would be a lucky date. <laughs> <laughs> my son usually is my lucky charm, my oldest son. Charles. So I had him pick the date and that was the date we set the exam. And I was one of the unlucky people that went all the way to 265. Oh. People telling me, oh, don't worry, you just finish, you know. And then, you know, 75, everything goes down. I remember looking. When we started, there were some doctors, you know, in the center. There were some doctors taking their exam and I was taking my exam. And I got to 75 and I looked at the computer. It didn't go down. I said, oh, crap. You know, I, I didn't know what that meant, but I just kept going. And I got to 100 and it still didn't go down. And then I got to 150 and it still. And then I said, well, you know what? I don't know what is going on with this test. I'm just going to keep going and see what happens. So I went all the way until I got to 264. And then being that I'm spiritually inclined, something kept telling me that people used to tell me that the way the board works, it's an up and down type of thing. You know, you get some questions right, you get and depending on how many or something. So I thought about that at 264 and I said, oh, wait a minute, you know, before I answer the last question, I'll just go ahead and think about it first. Really look about, look at it, think about it. So I did that and looked at it. And of course, as usual, you could only eliminate two for sure. Right, exactly, yes. I thought, okay, I'll look at it and yeah, that's the answer. No, it was not the answer. It was, like, oh my God. And then I started trying to remember, you know, the, the two last options trying to remember where I'd read anything about that or anything in that context. Of course, at that time, I couldn't remember. So I finally said, you know what, God, I've been doing this for seven, seven years between prerequisites, going through the program, working. If you want me to be a nurse, I'll get this, this last answer right. And then I just pick something. And then afterwards, you know, the next day I tried to people, you know, you say, oh, did you take your test? Yeah. Go in and check. I checked. I tried to check. When I tried to check, I realized I had such big anxiety. I started sweating profusely. I couldn't check it. 
So I called my uncle in Florida, in St. Petersburg, <laughs> and asked him to check. And he checked, and he found out I had passed, but he didn't tell me until after I'd finished work, you know, at the mm -hmm. county hospital. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me? I've been dying to know if any, when I didn't hear from you, I thought I'd failed, you know. And then he sent me my, you know, my RN number, and I started crying. I was driving back home to, you know, where I lived, and I was crying. It was on the 110, and people, you know how people pass by you, and, the, and people, ma'am, are you okay? I am perfectly fine. Don't worry. This is release of tension, a culmination of some things that I've been going through that have just ended. I am fine. But that was my story. Well, I, you know, that nursing, the NCLEX is nothing to sneeze at. Oh, when I took it, um, well, when I took it, you didn't know right away. So I had a month to wait to get my oh results. Oh, my God. And so I, I had prepared myself. I said, you know, I'm going to be the one to have to get all the questions. So I was prepared for that. Okay. So I go in, I start my test, and I get to around question 50, and I start to feel a little bit more comfortable, not as nervous, and mm -hmm. got to question 75. And I'm like, okay, I think I got this. And it shuts off. And then you panic. I, I didn't know what to do. I just was like, it, it stopped. It stopped. I thought either I was so stupid, it gave up on me, or maybe perhaps I passed. But I'm in there just crying and hyperventilating. It was so bad. The staff at the testing center made me sit there for 15 or 20 minutes before they would let me leave. Before they let you go. Because they were afraid that you won't be able to drive home. Yes, I I was just a nervous wreck, and I remember when I took my certification exam as a nurse practitioner, I took the test, and I had thought it would take a while to find out if you passed, and the preceptor says, congratulations, you passed, and I looked at him and go, wait, what are you talking about? Really? He said, yeah, it says right here you passed. I said, show it to I wouldn't believe him until I saw it. I was like, you sure? <laughs> That's what I'm, I mean, it's ridiculous. I have never, all the way from elementary school, high school, certifications, you know, you've done, I've never felt that way about yeah. anything. It's something I'll never forget and will always remember. Yes. Well, I want to go back to something that was very important you said in the beginning, because when you started your nursing program, you had been a CNA, and yes. for quite a while, might I add. Yes. And, and so I think that's important for any nursing students that may be listening or people who are thinking about going into nursing and listening to this, and you've worked in the lab or you've been a CNA for a long time, you've got to set aside everything that you learned when you're going into school. Exactly. Because you have to learn how to do it the textbook way. Exactly. And I tell my students all the time, I said, read the question and Answer what is asked. Forget about what you saw in clinical with Mr. Mm -hmm. Smith. Mm -hmm. That does not matter. You have all the information you need right there in the question. Right. And if you do that, you'll you'll do a lot better. I, I teach um, Q of A students. And when I first started teaching them, I had to teach the uh, dosage calculations. And I had been doing it for so long, I would do them in my head. <laughs> and so I had to go back and learn how to teach it again because I didn't know all the steps. I just had my shortcuts because I did it in my head. It's kind of the same thing. You know, you have to relearn those things. And every time you go forward in your education, there's something more that you have to learn. And I, I think that's such a valuable lesson. And, and then um, you were also, um, we're talking about, um, the NCLEX and passing NCLEX. So my question is, what was your first nursing job when you graduated from school? When my I finished, I graduated, I have to tell you, you know, life, it doesn't seem easy. You know, when I was working at the county as a CNA, I was working in the medical ICU. And in the medical ICU, what we were doing mainly was helping the nurses turn patients 
make sure they had their supplies, you know, to do thing, the work that they had to do. And, you know, run errands like take blood to the lab, take, uh, do different things, you know, that were more or less administrative kind of, or supply worthy. So when I was doing this work, I noticed, you know, when I was doing this, that it was extremely difficult for me to switch, you know, to switch mm -hmm. from being a CNA because I have to give you an insight into my CNA experience. My CNA experience was I had experience in the nursing homes. I had experience from the x-ray department in Georgia as a CNA. I had experience in home health as well. Mm -hmm. And I also then came to the hospital and had experience, you know, in the ICU working with the nurses. So by the time I got to the program, I was completely confused. Yeah. You know, I was completely confused because I didn't know what to apply to what because of the different areas of practice, you know, that I had gotten into. And like I told you, the only way I was able to overcome it was having that conference with that teacher that taught us fundamentals, you know, of nursing because I, I was practically in tears. I said, I don't know what to do. I take your test. You know how they give you a weekly test. I take your test yes. and I answer your questions, but there's a problem. You know, of course, I started panicking after the first test. I didn't wait. Right. You know, and she said, look, this, I know what your problem is. This is what your problem is. And she asked me these questions that you're asking me. And then she told me, you got to drop everything. Mm -hmm. Then besides that being a problem, I also had the problem from the county hospital where I work of people not believing you can do it. Nurses that you worked with, you know, uh, that were used to seeing you as a CNA. Yeah. They didn't want to see you as an RN. So that was in the mix as well you know, where people were kind of giving you negative feedback, you know, few people were encouraging you. Most people were kind of giving you negative feedback because they just wanted you to stay as a CNA, you know, and mm -hmm. just be there. And they believe like, how can she be a CNA and then suddenly be an RN? I mean, there's a big, it was for them, it was a big jump. Most of them were telling me, why don't you do your LVN first? You know, uh, you know, they kept saying, uh, you won't pass. Why don't you do your LVN first? And then if you pass that, then you can go to an RN. And I said, no, I'm going to do, I am not stupid. And I think I can do this and I'm going to go straight for the RN. So yeah. in terms of jobs, it was extremely difficult. It took me I, eight months to find mm -hmm. my job, the first job. Well, you know, it's sad how, it, you know, we have this phenomenon in nursing call, how nurses eat their young, which yes. I really hate that term. But I remember being a CNA in the nursing home and one of the um, CNAs that I work with became an LPN. They're mm -hmm. LPNs here in, in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And uh, she... Uh, finished her school and she became a nurse and immediately, you know, her nose went like this to all the other yes. CNAs, right? That, I saw that too. I saw yeah. a lot of that. But when I told them I was moving and changing buildings because, you know, I stayed with the company changing buildings at the time because one, I was, you know, engaged in getting married, but two, I was going to get my bachelor's and become an RN. Mm -hmm. It was like the biggest cold shoulder that I've ever gotten. Yes. yes. Because it was like, how dare you get a higher degree than, than I, me? I, and I'm like, yes. mm -hmm. um, lady, I almost had, I almost finished my bachelor's degree in biology, so I'm already a higher degree than you. Which is another reason why they didn't like me because I already had right, a, a because you already degree. had knowledge. Yeah, yeah, and and so it was kind of interesting to see that transition. But thankfully, I had some really great mentors 
when I started working at the hospital. Um, mm -hmm. They were really great and took me under their wing and gave me some great experiences and made sure that I got into some of those experiences. And so I wonder if a little bit of what you experienced might have been um, a cultural thing as well. Oh, no, it wasn't a cultural thing. It was more or less people. I have something that comes up when people meet me, especially in person. For some mm -hmm. reason, when people meet me in person, if there are problems, you know, for some reason, people say when they meet, me, I have no idea why, when they meet me that I intimidate them, even when I was a CNA. You know, and mm -hmm. I never could understand what, you know, where the issue was coming from. But I did notice that I had a lot of information, you know, like in different areas of life. Yes. I had a lot of information and a lot of experiences. And people didn't react very kindly to those experiences. People were thinking it was more or less a box thing. They wanted you as a CNA, you should remain a CNA. And unfortunately, me being entrepreneur minded, I wasn't willing to do that. So that kind of affected a whole, you know, bunch of other things. And uh, when, unlike you, when I was at the hospital, I didn't have any mentors. I had to go through everything myself wow. because where I worked at was the ICU. And a lot of the nurses that were there were nurses that weren't willing to help. You know, it was like they said, why should she? So I just went, went it alone. The only mentors I would say that I have were one or two doctors because our hospital where I worked is a training, you know, a training hospital. So there yes. are residents, you know, mm -hmm. and attendings. And, and I had a few doctors that were going through their residency. And what helped me out was because I was so, you know, I was friendly with them and was always willing to help. They would call me when they were doing procedures, you know, like, uh, they had a patient, you know, with ascites and they wanted to do a thoracentesis or a paracentesis or some other, you know, bronchoscopy, some other uh, procedure. They actually invited me in to come and assist because they knew I was in nursing school. But most of the nurses never invited me in, never showed me how to put in an IV never gave me any feedback except for, you know, come and help me turn this patient, you know, and make sure this patient is clean. Other than that, they wouldn't, you know, do anything. So I had to go it alone, but I had made up my mind that I was going to do this because I was a single mother with two boys in middle school and high school. I didn't have an option to fail. So I went ahead and did everything on my own. It took me about eight months of at the same hospital, at the same hospital, running from department to department to try and get somebody to hire. You, but, that's I that is so encouraging to hear that you stayed with it. I have a new grad now that I've uh, been in contact with and helping to mentor, and she was working in LND, labor and delivery, mm -hmm. and she wanted to stay there. And the nurses, she's working there as a tech. She, you know, has done a whole bunch of other schooling. The nurses, the nurse manager wouldn't hire her mm -hmm. because they're like, oh, no, you need to have two years before you can come work for us. Yeah, in the ICU refused to hire me. I had worked mm -hmm. with her for six years. She refused to hire me. Yeah. It's a hierarchy thing. And, and this is what I was trying to explain to her. I said, it's a hierarchy. I said, you may have to work in a, in a, on a specialty that you're not as interested in, but you can get your foot in the door. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's what happened yeah. to me. Yeah. 
I had to go out of the ICU and eventually got hired in ortho. Ortho okay. slash med surge. That mm -hmm. was where I got my first job. Well, I it was it's funny when I graduated, uh, the nurses at one particular hospital, especially on the pediatric floor, really didn't want to teach us anything because they were afraid that we were after their jobs. It was a really bad political situation. So I did apply to work at that hospital and I applied at another hospital, praying that I would get it to the other hospital. And so the second hospital was kind of slow to hire me, but the first hospital just kind of haphazardly offered me a job in mid-surge. And I had already worked in the mid-surge floors and stuff like that. And so I said, I called them and said, hey, listen, they want to hire me in mid-surge. I have to take this job. I need a job unless you can guarantee me a job. I know you can't take me as a graduate nurse, but I need you to give me a job offer once I get my license because mm -hmm. I, I need to know, should I take this job? And fortunately, they, they called me and they made an agreement that I can come in. As soon as I got my license, I was on the job. Um, I was very excited because I thought I was making big betting back then. I was making $18 an hour. I was like, Woo <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm making big money now. Exactly. But, well, I went from uh, making $7.25, $8.25 an hour. So that was like a $10 jump. So, yeah, when I started, I was a CNA, I was making $4.25 an hour. <laughs> I started with $4.25 at TJ Maxx. Mm -hmm. I started just like you, four twenty five in Georgia with TJ Maxx. Yep, yep. And I, it was three, yeah. it was three eighty five, but they had just increased the minimum wage, so I went up to four twenty five. When I left the nursing home, I was up to six eighty five. When I started working at the hospital, I was up to seven twenty five. Mm-hmm. And then I stayed a couple of years, so I was slowly got a little bit of raises. I got a two cent raise once for my boss. It's like I'm calling to tell you get a raise. I'm like, oh great, yeah, how much cents. is it? She's like, it's two cents. I'm like, two cents. She said, well, two really? cents is two cents. I just wanted to smack her. <laughs> that they used to do that at the county. You know, they would call you in and they would say, oh, you're getting a raise, and when you ask, oh, it's twenty five cents. I'm like, what? 25 cents because you kind of knew 25 cents or anything in the cents category yeah. by the time the tax people the irs get done with it you you won't even know you got a raise exactly exactly yeah i, I that was an interesting interesting time so then fast forward to when working in nursing how did you go from working on the floor at the bedside to becoming an entrepreneur? Well, um, that's a funny story. The idea of uh, legal nurse consulting was actually in my brain before okay. I went, I started going to nursing school. I was at the time seeing a lot of ads from Vicky Malazzo. Ah, yes. Mm -hmm. in, in magazines, I was seeing a lot of ads and I loved, you know, I like advocacy. I like the legal stuff. So I was like, ooh, I can do this, you know, and it said it was a certification, you know, not like a degree course. So I said, oh, okay. So it's not like I have to go in the university and do this. And then I called the Vicky Malazzo Institute and they told me I had to be an RN. Mm -hmm. to be able to be a legal nurse consultant. And I was like, what? I have to be an RN? I didn't know that. And then I went back home and thought about it. And then I said, well, I guess, you know, besides my grandfather's situation, I said, I guess we'll just have to go to nursing school. <laughs> <laughs> so by the time I finished, and I worked about two or three years as an RN. I decided the hospital, you know, politics, all kinds of things. The hospital wasn't for me. I found a job with an insurance company as a workers comp uh, case manager where I was working from home. 
And that was when my journey for legal nurse consulting started. And that was when I went to the Vicky Malazzo um, program in 2014. My program was in Vegas at that time. We went there in person and before you left, you had to take a test. And if you mm -hmm. pass the test, then you could practice as a CLNC. At that time, there was no AALNC. We didn't have a choice. I love the AALNC program. It is perfect. Unfortunately, that was not available when I started. Right. Yeah. So I had to, you know, go this route, but it was always there. That was always the end game. Now, defense medical exams was not um, on my radar, you know, initially, even though I learned a little bit, you know, just brushed a little bit of it at the Vicky Milazzo Institute. But what had happened was I was when I started after Vicky Milazzo for the first two years, I was doing the same thing everybody was doing, you know, chronologies, merit reviews, cases, trying to be an expert witness, you know, in different areas that I was. And I noticed I wasn't getting very many offers, even though I was, you know, advertising and everything. And I wasn't getting many offers. And I said to myself, hmm. This is not looking good, you know. Well, the first two years, I was kind of dilly-dallying, working uh, as the case manager, as well as trying to do this. And then finally, one day, I met a lady, and she called me. She found my information in the database for the CLNCs at the Vicky mm -hmm. Palazzo Institute. And she said, have you done a DME before? And I said, no, I haven't, you know, but I have read about it. I did it, you know, in the Vicky Malazzo program a little bit, but I haven't really done one. And she said, well, I need someone. She needed someone like right away. And she knew I was a CLNC. And I said, oh yeah, I'll go. I said, do you mind training me? And she said, yeah, she, no problem, I'll train you. And she trained me. And after she trained me, uh, I went to two exams with her. And after two exams, I kind of felt comfortable, you know. And mm -hmm. I started doing the exams, her exams, you know, and other people's exams myself. And then one day I said, hmm, I like this. I really like this because I used to love to fight with the doctors at the hospital. <laughs> so once I noticed it was the same thing here, I was like, ooh, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. And I've been here ever since. Well, can you explain for those listening, because there may be some that are listening that don't know what a defense medical exam is. Uh, so would you please explain what it is and what it is that you do? Yeah, a defense medical exam is usually, well, they'll see it in both ways. There are some doctors call it an independent medical exam, and most attorneys will call it defense medical exam. The reason why most attorneys don't want to call it a defense, uh, an independent medical exam is the definition of independent is Someone, or if you're going to a doctor, it has to be a doctor that has no connection to the plaintiff side or no connection to the defense side. Somebody that's completely neutral, which is not the case with yes. defense medical exams. The defense medical exams are the exams that the insurance company or whoever is being sued is requesting that the client go through that mandatory exam with a doctor that is on their list, not a doctor that the defense and the plaintiff agree on. The plaintiff has no choice in who the doctor is that they go to for that particular exam. And the, the essence of the exam is most of the attorneys already know, you know, that there's a case there. In most cases, there's already been a deposition. 
usually the attorneys on the defense side already have the medical records. So they kind of have an overview of what's going on with this client. The essence of this exam is to see to what extent the client has gotten worse as a result of the injuries or possibly gotten better and what treatments the client has done as a result of the injury. But unfortunately, over the years, doctors have twisted it around, the defense doctors, and they try to call it independent medical exam. And at first, when I started, I used to fight with them all the time. I said, no, sir, stop calling it an independent medical exam. It's a defense medical exam. And then I noticed one thing. Attorneys like to call it defense medical exam, and the doctors, no matter what you did, yeah. called it an independent medical exam because supposedly that's what the insurance company called it. And as far as they were concerned, the insurance company is God. So they go by whatever the insurance company wants or whatever the, the insurance company says. Yeah. They're, they're the ones paying their bills. So. <laughs> they're the ones paying the bills. So they're going to call it whatever those people call it. And I try to explain that when I have patients, I try when I prep them to let them know, look, you know, this is what the problem is. This is the situation. Just go along with it. We will, you know, we are here to protect your rights, to advocate and stop this doctor from asking any questions he's not supposed to ask. And, and, and that that's important because you do want to protect the rights of the individual. I mean, and so that's the role of a legal nurse consultant in mm -hmm. that capacity when you're dealing with IMEs or DMEs um, is to protect that individual and make sure that they ask the questions they're supposed to ask because the attorney can't go. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, sometimes the attorney goes, but technically I always bring that into focus when I talk about the, uh, you know, defense medical exams. The reason why the attorneys don't go is first of all, two things, their schedule most of the time doesn't mm -hmm. permit because they're either in depositions or they're in court, or even if their time permitted, most of the time, the amount they charge to go for the exam, the client is not happy with. So yeah. by the time we started coming in focus, it was more appealing to the doctor and to the attorneys to hire us because we were cheaper. Than yes. <laughs> if, he went, if he went, you know, a nurse doesn't get, you know, charged what a lawyer does. So because we're a little bit cheaper, they are able to present that because their clients have to also give the approval and okay for a nurse to come to the exam. And that's usually the terminology they go with. They say, oh yeah, you know, uh, I, if, if I go, it costs you this much money. And if the nurse goes, first of all, she's a nurse. She knows what the doctor is talking about. She knows what he's supposed to do and what he's not supposed to do. And this is how much she charges. And then the client says, oh, yeah, no problem. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a good, a good attorney in your, in your pocket that can help explain why your services exactly. are needed. Exactly. Definitely. So what, what has been one of your biggest hurdles when you started your business? My biggest hurdle actually was no support. You know, no mentor support. That was one of the reasons why I got off the list at the CLNC, you know, uh, mm -hmm. program. Because first of all, they charge like $800. First of all, you, I had to pay four grand just to get the certification. And then every two years, you had to pay $800 just to keep it. And there was no uh, support. There was no mentorship. Nobody, if you wanted to talk to anybody about any kind of mentoring, you had to pay more money, you know, to do things. And at the time, everything was kind of uh, sketchy. You know, there, there's not as much, there wasn't as much opportunities like the AALNC as there is now, where there's a lot more knowledge out there. So 
basically, I played it by ear. Everything that I know up to date and the knowledge that I have, I had to educate myself by reading books, talking to doctors, talking to nurses, talking to other CLNCs that had been in the business longer than I had, going to conferences, nursing conferences, legal nurse consulting conferences, and also exhibiting. So it was a struggle, but I eventually got there. But I did it all by myself. There was nothing. They, and, and what's great is that now there are a lot of those um, programs that are more supportive and built yes. in that um, support network. And I have to say, we're both in a great program that's very supportive. <laughs> um, and so shout out to Lori <laughs> because she could. Yeah, could Lori has a, yeah. a very supportive program. And I heard about her program. And actually, it was really, I you remember, it was really funny how I joined. I just went for that LinkedIn, you know, the yeah. to find out how to use LinkedIn. But then when I listened to her talk and explain how she does things, and I said, you know what? I think I'm going to, even though I'm already, I think I, what I have to say, what I loved about her program other programs that I have gone through, they give you information. Yes. But they don't give you any, you know, leads. Yes. Or any leads for you to get anywhere or do anything. And that was different with Lori's program. She gives a lot of leads that you have to follow up on. And I'm following up on, you know, some She's of those. Very action oriented. She's very yes. action oriented. Yes. She was the one that told me to start writing the second book because she said it would be a marketing tool for me at uh, attorney conferences. Even my book, she said, you should make sure if you go to any conferences that, you know, legal nurse consulting conferences, you bring your book as well. You bring a number of books with you so you can give it to people and people will see and then, you know, spread the word to other people. So she's like action oriented. And I told her um, the other day when I talked to her, I'm not able to get on some of the calls because I'm so busy, you know, running my business, trying to do other things, trying to get speaking engagements, writing the book. And also I have in, in the works a Weber app that is supposed to help nurses and attorneys streamline the DME process. Oh, that sounds yeah, great. You don't have to, you know, you they don't have any uh, jump from, you know how right now as a DME provider, this is what you do. You know, you get a call from an attorney and they want you to do a DME. You tell them that's no problem. Can you email us the information? The attorney emails you the information. Then you have to go in and go into your phone and, you know, look at nurses that you have that can go to the DME, go back and forth and try to get someone to cover the DME. Then you got to send the paperwork to that particular nurse if she agrees, you know, to do the DME. And then after that, there's also the invoicing portion of it and getting paid, whether it's from the attorney or the nursing side. Well, my app has all these things in one place. Wonderful. All you have to do is go into the app. The lawyers have to go into the app, just like the nurses, sign up, you know, create an account, sign mm -hmm. up. And once they sign up, then they can start sending DMEs. And once they send DMEs, I'm going to be looking in that app in the computer because all the nurses are already uploaded that I have. And I would send messages, you know, from there to the nurses to see if they could do certain, you know, DMEs. And once they tell me they can do the DMEs, I just transfer the case from admin to the nurse. And when she finishes, the only thing she's going to be doing outside the program is the actual report because, you know, of formats and everything. 
But once she's finished with her report, she's going to upload it in the app. And even more so, I will be able to cut out the cost of Hightail. I use Hightail because it's a HIPAA compliant, you know, program where I can store all my audio files for seven mm -hmm. years because in California we have to store them for seven years. It's going to, that's going to be stored in the app as well. Okay. And upload the audio. And then once I look it over and make sure everything is okay, I create an invoice in the app and then send it over to the attorney and say, okay, now you got to pay me. And the good part about the app, be us being human, when lawyers send me cases, you know how usually when we do cases now, you have your email and when you go daily, you go down as far as you think you should go. Mm -hmm. Keyword is think. Right. Go. And you say, okay, this is, I think, all I needed to do for today. And sometimes you miss one or two things unless somebody, you know, calls you or emails you just following up on this situation, da, 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 da. And what is beautiful with the app is every time I open it in the morning, it's going to show me how many DME requests I have from the attorney, how many nurses requests I have, you know, things that I have to do for the nurses, and it also shows me if I haven't paid the nurses. And it shows me if the lawyers haven't paid me either. And it comes like a, you know. Like a dashboard. Like a dashboard, you know. Yes. So everything is in one place. And I can finally stop going to five or six places, you know, oh. trying to get it done. So that's one arm of it. And the second arm, I also have, uh, I've developed, uh, the developer is still doing that. I'm developing also a Weber Learning Academy. In the Weber Learning Academy, there's going to be a lot of podcasts like you have here. And just to let you know, you have to be on my podcast. I said it during your... I would be happy to. Just give me the schedule. You have to be on my podcast. Mm -hmm. Once I start, there's going to be a lot of articles uploaded, blogs, because what I'm trying to do is give people more information. I'm going to be writing a lot more articles than I have in the past. And I'm going to be researching into laws in the different states regarding DMEs and uploading that information onto the Learning Academy. And people can go in and download this stuff. For, oh, that'd be great. You know, a minimal fee, maybe like $5, $10 or whatever. You know, you go download whatever. Because instead of, because I see people, I, I came up with this idea from all the face groups, you mm -hmm. know, groups that I'm in. I see kind of questions. People are always asking questions about certain things. So I thought I wouldn't, because there's a lot of people already doing legal nurse consulting in general. So I mm -hmm. said I would leave legal nurse consulting in general and just focus on DMEs. Well, and, you know, it's and easy working them. for you, right? It is easy mm -hmm. to work for me. Most nurses mm -hmm. that I work with, they always tell me, oh, you know, Sylvia, you don't sound like a boss. And I asked them, what do you mean I don't sound like a boss? Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, bosses are usually overly, you know, they try to make things complicated. They're overly protective. I said, there's no need, you know, knowledge is meant to be shared. What use is the knowledge if we don't share it with other people? And uh, unfortunately, that wasn't the case mm -hmm. when I started. But I uh, operate in a climate of we have to raise, we might be the pioneers in whatever we're doing, but we got to take the next generation with us. And the idea of the next generation is to make the next generation better than yes. what we did. You know, the idea is, okay, we did, we might have done mistakes, you know, Right. We have done a lot of things maybe that 
we could have done differently and we can with the next generation that can be changed and things can always be improved on and the previous lncs that i came across the older ones were not willing very much to share information this information sharing is just now in the last five ten years that that has come to fruition well, one of the things that's important that you said that I don't want us to miss um, is that you saw a need and you became innovative and answered that need. You saw a need in the Facebook groups and threads and talking with other LNCs and nurses, and you went and answered the call and your business is about fulfilling that need. And I want people to hear that because as a business owner, that's your role. That's your job is to see the need in the marketplace mm -hmm. and fill it. And so Thank I you. applaud you for that. Thank you. That's, you know, that's the idea I've been, you know, I'm not a fan of going on Facebook groups and somebody writes something and you go on the need, you know, and write something negative, you know, I was raised by my mother. My mother was German. My dad was Nigerian. If you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. Mm -hmm. If you see something that you feel like offends you, there's no need. What I took from all those groups, everything negative, positive that I saw, I took it on me, inside me, and made it something constructive. I considered whatever was negative, you know, on those groups, I looked at those things as needs, you know, like people were presenting them negatively yes. on the group, but it was something that hadn't been addressed by previous, you know, LNCs or previous educators, whatever. So I was like, huh, I think, you know, we should start and like I explained, that's how the book came about because I noticed everybody was writing about DMEs, but I noticed nobody had talked about a book. Mm -hmm. So I thought about information, you know, that I knew. And I said, I know a lot about DMEs. Maybe I can help out in this department. But then I said, oh, well, you know, writing books, I'm not, you know, good at the writing thing. But then I remembered that you could get a ghostwriter, you know, to help write your book. And I searched and I found Pat Iyer. Yes, I love Pat. She's been on our I show. I love Pat. She's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And we clicked. Mm -hmm. And that's how that DME book came about. I gave her pretty much the whole, you know, all the research and information in the book. But she put everything in order and in the way it should be when you write a book because I didn't know how to do that. And I am so grateful to her and we'll go back to her for books in the future. Well, that's well. wonderful. I took her book writing course and it's helped me as I started writing my own books. Um, and hopefully we'll get the first uh real book, I guess I should say, not just the audio, I mean, the right. um, uh, ebook, but actually get mm -hmm. a real book published. Um, so I'm close to that. Um, mm -hmm. First draft is done, working on the second draft. Uh, before I send it to the editor, because, you know, <laughs> that's me. Send I have to look Pat. at it again. Send it to Pat. You know, that's she, a good idea. I could send, send it, it to Pat. Pat because she said she goes with me. We started from the beginning, you mm -hmm. know. We had no draft, no nothing. We formulated everything and started. But she does do, you know, like people have already a book. And I have to tell you, she is excellent in from working with her. She's excellent. You give her something like you give her that draft and she looks at it. She will give you insights into what you've written and mm -hmm. how you can improve on what you've written and will actually give you uh, feedback in terms of uh, uh, if you don't have something in your book, she'll tell you, okay, why don't you write? I know you wrote about this, but why don't you also address this? She was excellent at that. Oh, wonderful. 
Well, you know, our time is coming, winding down. So I want to ask this, this last question mm -hmm. uh, before we get to uh, contacting you and your promotion. But um, if you had one piece of advice for a budding entrepreneur, what would it be? Keep at it. Persistence. Keep at it. Whatever your passion is, stick with it. Don't let anybody dissuade you from it. If you have an idea in your head that you're thinking about, and when you wake up, you think about that idea. When you go to sleep, you think about that idea. You need to bring it to fruition. That means there's a need for something, and that means God wants you to share that information with the world. But the main thing is the problem is people are not persistent. People are not consistent. You need to be consistent. You need to be ready for the ups and downs that are come that will come within your search. And then eventually you'll get to where you're going. All right. You heard it here. Persistence. Be persistent. So you have an offer, a promotion for our listeners. Um, you're offering your book, The Defense Medical Exams Easy, and your online course, Defense Medical Examinations Made Easy. Where can they get a copy of your book and, and um, register for your course? The course is on Pat for, for right now until I get Weber Lee Learning Academy up and running. It is on Pat Iyer's website in terms of the course. Okay. You can get it there. And my book is available on Amazon. Okay. It's yeah, it's available on Amazon, and in the next three months, there will also be it will also be available on, on Amazon in audio. Awesome! Well. I've All had right. a lot of people, nurses especially, Sylvia, can you make it audio, please? You know, we don't have time to sit down and read the book, so that's in the works too. Okay, great. So, how would somebody contact you if they wanted to get in touch with you? They, if they want to get in touch with me, they just need to email me, Sylvia, S-I-L-V-I-A, at Weber, W-E-B-E-R, LegalNurse.com. Or they could go to my website, www.WeberLegalNurse.com, and they would be able to contact me. And they can also call me at 310-340-9618. Okay. All right. All right. So there we have it. I want to thank you for uh, being here and being a wonderful guest. Uh, thank so you. thank you, Sylvia, for your time. This has been the Nurse Shark Academy show. I'm Tina Baxter, your host. And I want to remind you, if you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you get notified of all of our episodes. Also, if you're listening to us uh, uh, through Podbean, you can go to Podbean and download our episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for tuning in and have a great rest of your day. Hey, hey, before you go, exciting news about the Nurse Shark Academy show. The Nurse Shark Academy show has been nominated for a Women in Podcasting Award, so please vote for me. We are nominated in the business category. So go ahead and cast your vote for us for the Women in Business Podcast Award. Uh, for the Nurse Shark Academy show, and you can vote, vote for us at www.thenursesharkacademy.biz forward slash podcast awards. Thank you for listening to the Nurse Shark Academy show wherever you get your podcasts or watching us on YouTube. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and don't forget to hit the notification bell so that you'll know when all of our episodes come out. If you want further information, you can contact us on the nurse shark academy.biz.